Um, Jung is the person we're going to talk about today and next time. I'm going to talk about him in some ways indirectly because the best way to understand Jung is to show you what you do with his ideas rather than really presenting the ideas themselves. But I can give you a bit of an overview. So, one of the things that differentiates the depth psychologists from, say, behavior therapists, and even from cognitive scientists, is that you might say in one way they're more mystical, which means more from the romantic tradition than the cognitive scientists and the behaviorists. So there's a temperamental split there, because people who are high in openness, and both Freud and Jung were very, very high in trade openness, are very interested in the domain of the imagination and the domain of fantasy, because they have very active imaginations, and they have very active fantasy lives, and they're good visualizers. And so, um, one of the things I've noticed in my clinical practice, that there's always been a joke about depth psychologists, that if you go see a Freudian, you have Freudian dreams, and if you go see a Jungian, you have Jungian dreams, and I suppose that means if you go to a behavior therapist that you don't have any dreams at all. But I actually think there's some truth in that, because the more pragmatic people, the more practical people, are not going to be attracted to therapists who deal with issues that have to do, say, with the imagination or fantasy. And so there's a natural parsing. One of the things I've noticed in my clinical practice is that just imaginative people, so those would be open and creative people, um, have a dream life that they cries out to be interpreted in archetypal terms. Like, I've had clients, a number of them now, I have one right now, I mean, it's, it's, his dream life is, is it's, so remar it's so rich, it's remarkable. He's a, he's a genius dreamer. Every time he comes in, there's like he has two dreams or three dreams. They're coherent, they're complexly plotted, they're interesting, and, and they chart what's going on in his life, and they tell him what he should do. It's like, it's, it's great. It's, but everyone isn't like that. I also have clients who never dream at all. And then I've also seen when I've lectured to people, I see this most particularly in, in medical students, because I've lectured a bit to medical students. It's like, so maybe I'll do a seminar for the, for the medical students and tell them a little bit about the symbols of transformation, really, because they're involved in, first of all, transforming, because they're medical students, and so you have to transform into a doctor. And also, of course, they're helping people through transformations all the time, often negative, but not always, often, sometimes positive, because sometimes you get better. And so it's useful, possibly, for them to understand those processes more deeply. Generally, with the medical school, students, I do half lecture that's more on like trait psychology, more behavioral, and half of it on the more symbolic stuff, which is kind of like this class is. Um, and there's always about half the medical students on whom the more symbolic stuff just falls flat. It just, they just don't. It's like talking about color to people who are colorblind. And I, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I really do think it's based in temperamental differences. So, you know, if you have an active fantasy life, and you have an active imagination, and you're a good visualizer, and you dream a lot, then that's the sort of person you are. And if, you, and if you're on the other end of the scale, which would be that you're very conscientious, let's say, and very low in openness, which also tends to make you more conservative in your political presuppositions, by the way, then Dream analysis is probably not for you, partly because you're just not going to come up with that many dreams. And even if they, even if you do, they won't necessarily be informative. So, it, you know, there's been a, a very long battle in some ways in the psychological and psychiatric community between people who take different perspectives on how you might address psychological problems. But I don't know if the, the issue of type has been thought about seriously enough in that regard. Because we're really only starting to understand the dimensions, the actual dimensions of personality properly and to figure out what it means to be on one end of, say, openness and, and versus the other one. Especially if you're intelligent. You can be intelligent, not open. Those are complicated people. They've got very analytical minds. They make good lawyers. Like lawyers are often, and this is something you might think about if you're planning to become a lawyer. Um, if you're high in openness, it's a bad job for you. You will not be happy. You need to be really conscientious, like off the scale, and it helps to be disagreeable too. So, because if you're too agreeable, well, you're supposed to win if you're a lawyer. You're not supposed to like nicely let the other person win, you know, 
you're supposed to fight to win. And so you have to be kind of fighty to do that. And if you're high in agreeableness, then it's a job that's kind of grates against your temperament. So anyways, so you, you were, you, I think the best way to think about Jung is that he was a student of two people. He was a student of Friedrich Nietzsche and he was a student of Freud. And although the Freudians, when they write the history of psychoanalytic thought, they pretty much portray Jung as, a, as like a derivative thinker of Freud. Um, it's not the right way to think about his positioning historically, because in some ways what, what Jung was trying to do was to answer the question that Nietzsche posed at the end of the 19th century. And, because, and the reason Jung was trying to answer it was because he believed it was the most important question that had been posed at the end of the 19th century, and that was, you know, there's a famous quote by Nietzsche, right? And I'm sure you've all heard it, and that's the quote, God is dead. So what Nietzsche said essentially was, God is dead and we have killed him. And that's a different idea. And we'll never find enough water to wash away the blood. And so it wasn't like a triumphal statement on Nietzsche's part, even though when you hear it quoted, you always hear it quoted that way. It's like it's a sort of victory, God is dead, you know, or something to celebrate. It's not what Nietzsche thought at all. In fact, he thought all hell was going to break loose because of it. And he predicted as much in, like, in, the, in, the, in, like in the 1870s. I mean, he predicted what was going to happen in the 20th century with re it's ridiculous accuracy. Like, it's uncanny. And that's partly because, you know, Nietzsche was one of these people like Jung who are very grounded in their deep, deep, deep imaginations. And so they get wind of the currents that are moving through society long before normal people do. So in some sense, you know, you can imagine that in any given population, you guys, there's some of you guys who are living like 50 years ago, and there's some of you living now, and there's some of you living 50 years in the future. It depends on how intelligent, imaginative, versus how conservative you are. Because it's not like everyone develops at exactly the same historical rate. You get people like Nietzsche, for example, or Dostoevsky, they're like 100 years ahead of everyone else. And so, you know, people don't even know what to do with them. But Stendhal was like that too, the, the writer, he wrote the 1830s, and he was convinced that he was 100 years ahead of his time. And stylistically, that was probably about right. So, and the people who were prophets, regarded as prophets in, in say, Old Testament tradition, they were the same sort of people. It's like, they had their ear to the ground, in a sense, and they could tell what was going on underneath everybody's facade. It, it echoed in them, and the, off, often, as the stories go, and I'm sure they have, they have a mythological accuracy to them. The people who were picking up the underground currents indicating often catastrophe felt absolutely compelled, even at the risk of their own skin, to warn people. So, so, Nick, so Jung was definitely one of these people, and now the, this question, God is dead and, and we have killed him, led Nietzsche to pose another question, which was, well, what are we going to do to replace him? Because Nietzsche believed, and I think, it, I think he was absolutely right about this, I can't see how it could be otherwise, he believed that the morality that had structured Western society was predicated on the fundamental axiom of divinity. And so, like the whole, as far as Nietzsche was concerned, the whole corpus of morality was dependent on, the, on the, that axiom being true, or at least being accepted as true. And when that axiom was knocked out by, say, the conflict between science and religion, because in some sense that's what did it, then the whole system no longer had anything to stand on and could become entirely questioned. And so Nietzsche pointed that out, and then Dostoevsky, who was writing basically at the same time, said, well, if there's no God, then anything is permitted. And what he meant by that was, Really, in some sense, what he meant by that was morality turns into what, what you can get away with. Because there's, there's nothing final about it. There's nothing transcendent about it. And, like, we played this problem out intellectually. You guys are still right in the middle of this battle, whether you know it or not. I mean, so what happened in the 20th century was that one of the consequences of that loss of a, of a fundamental underpinning led... Europe to swing radically to political extremes. You know, the Nazis were to think of the to think of the Nazis without thinking of that as a religious transformation. That's just not right. It was a religious transformation, and it wasn't a good one. So, like, it was a regression in some sense to, to a morality that was way pre-Christian. Like, it was not good. And then, you know, you had to say it was like the rise of the state as an alternative to God. But we we saw what that produced. Produced hundreds of millions of painful deaths, and it just about destroyed the world.